Good morning, church. Good morning. We're happy to see you. Happy to have you here online. We are going to get started, so please join us in worshiping. You can stand, sit, but open yourself up to the work of the Holy Spirit. So we say, Holy Spirit, come. Oh my 
and in wonder saying you alone are unlike any other hear our praises as we welcome you together for 
with expectation today. We expect you here. follower of Jesus, whether you're in the room or you're watching from home, there are some elements here in the room you can gather around and home we give you some time to, to do that. <laughs> we love, we serve each other, right? Even if it's mom, look at her go. Especially his mom, right? It's awesome. So we come together as a family to do communion celebrate and on the night that Jesus was betrayed he took the cup sorry he took the bread he took the bread first and he broke it and says this is my body and this is given to you let's take and eat and in the same way he took the cup he says this is my blood, and this represents a new covenant that I have with you, a new promise, a new promise, a new covenant together. And as often you do this, remember me. So let's take and drink. Lord, we thank you that you're a God that, that came here to earth to be with us, to commune with us, to die for us and to rise for us. And we thank you for your presence and we ask for more of you. Just be here, dwell here today as we come and we worship you and we engage with you and we learn more about you. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Dave. If you are watching from home, um, and you're new, we'd love to find out more about you. So there's ways that you can do that on our website. If you're in the room, there is a QR code in front of you. You can scan and you can give us a little information or ask some questions about our church. We'd love to get you connected in any way. And if you don't like the QR code, there's some paper uh, in the back um, that you can fill out the little form rather than the QR code. So welcome. Uh, I'm going to give a few announcements and then we're going to have a teaching and we're going to do some more worship after. Uh, the only major announcements I have, one, is if you are a member here, this is your church home, we ask that you would give and give generously as God has given to you. And a few ways you can do that is the old-fashioned way, which is the box in the back, the black box, at any time for tithes and offerings. And then you can also give online or text to give, and that information is on the screen. Uh, we are doing a little partnership coming up Easter with... Uh, St. Vincent de Paul meal site program. A lot of you may know that there is a meal site that runs underneath us right now uh, in the basement of this building, and they serve every day but Saturday, and they're doing a special dinner on Easter. And what we've decided to do is give Easter bags, they're not baskets, they're bags, um, to the kids that come down there. So what we're asking you to do, if you would go this week and gather some candy or eggs, things that are sort of already sealed up and wrapped, and if you would bring those next Sunday and put them in the bags that are in the lobby, we're going to make sure that we distribute them on that day. And uh, if you'd like more information on how you can volunteer down there, you can see Rebecca or I, uh, and we can help you get connected. Uh, the other thing, the other announcement we have is Good Friday is coming up. We will have a Good Friday service here at 7 p.m. Did I get that right? 7, yeah, 7 p.m. Um, so please come and, um, and uh, be with us for Good Friday. That's all the announcements I have. Rebecca's going to come and give us a teaching today. Good morning. Um, so I don't know if this will surprise you or not, but when I was growing up, I used to have frequent pretty, pretty severe temper tantrums. I don't know if you can picture that, but uh, when something would not go my way or I felt like I wasn't being heard or I don't know, I just had really big emotions as a kid and I would often be sent to my room because apparently big emotions are sometimes inappropriate 
And so I would get into my room and I would rage. And I would often, I was very like self-defeating. I would often like kind of destroy my own bedroom. So I'd like rip posters off the wall and like just empty off shelves full of toys and just go crazy, like throwing my stuffed animals and just crying and raging until I would exhaust myself. And uh, sometimes after I'd like calm down, I would sometimes write really mean notes to my mom, like, you're the worst mom ever, you know, like, I wish I was never, you know, I wish I was born into a different family, all sorts of mean notes, and I'd tape them up on my wall. And then um, often, inevitably, the next morning, I'd wake up in a different frame of mind and rip them down quickly before she saw them. But um, I often have memories of that, of just really feeling like these out of control emotions as a kid. And eventually I developed some self-regulation and I stopped raging and all of that and, and I grew up. Um, but the thing is, I still have big emotions. I still have sometimes deep feelings of anger or grief or joy or anxiety or fear, all sorts of things. So I still have these emotions. I just don't destroy my bedroom anymore. And um, can anyone else relate? Like, anyone else ever feel, you know, super lonely? A uh, sense of being unanchored or unloved or unseen? A sense of sadness you can't really explain or despair? Um, or, like, huge moments of hope um, and then huge moments of disappointment? All sorts of big emotions. Any big, em big emotion feelers out there? Now, some of you uh, may not relate. You're like, I have learned to ignore my emotions, <laughs> and I don't often know how I feel. Or maybe not ignore them, you just can't access them. You have trouble maybe naming them. But you might be aware that something's not right. You may have a sense of discontentment, or a sense that your life's not going the way you thought it was going to go, or just this general like sense of, like, I'm not happy with my life, or I'm, I'm disappointed. I thought this was going to happen, and this didn't happen. And maybe you can't name the feeling that goes with it, but you know you're unhappy for some reason. And maybe you're, grie you're grieving over your disappointment and wondering where God is in all this. You know, does he care? Like, is he noticing me and, like, what's happening in my life? Is he ignoring me? Is he mad at me? Why doesn't he do what I thought he said he was going to do? So how do we pray when we're mad or sad or disappointed in our circumstances or even at God himself? Is that even allowed? Well, if we're using the Bible as our guide into the heart and mind of God, then it appears that God himself experiences the full range of emotions and that he designed us to experience the full range of emotions, and that he welcomes an honest, unfiltered expression of our emotions, particularly the difficult ones, through a form of prayer called lament. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. What does it mean to lament? So a lament, if you're wondering what that is, you've never heard of a lament, is a passionate prayer expressing sorrow, pain, or confusion. So sometimes our emotions are not painful ones, but a lament is typically the kind of prayer that's associated with sorrow, with pain, with confusion, with grief, with disappointment. In the Hebrew, the word lament means to wail or howl. So it gives you a sense, like this is like I've got some deep feelings that need to be expressed. And so there's many examples of laments actually throughout the, all of Scripture. Like we could just go through start to finish Lots of examples of prayer. But some of the most popular ones actually come from a book called Lamentations, which is basically five poems that are all a lament. And then some of the most other uh, well-known forms of lament are in the Psalms. And the Psalms, most, most, like 75 of them were written by King David, and he was a big feeler and a poet and a harp player. And um, he was also persecuted and went through some really hard stuff and confusing stuff. And so a lot of the Psalms are him. It's almost like his personal diary, right? We almost like get an insight into his internal wrestling and his crying out to God and his process. And so um, Lamentations is a unique book. And we don't really know the author. They have a guess of who they think the author is. But 
the author is basically has survived and is reflecting back on Babylon's siege of Jerusalem and all the destruction and exile that followed. So the author is sort of like describing a grief that an entire nation is experiencing, the people of God are experiencing. So I'm going to read you just an excerpt of this. If you're curious, you can read about that exile in 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25. But I'm just going to read to you part of it, Lamentations 3, starting in verse 1. And just see if, like, can you ever relate to this, these feelings? I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. You ever felt like that? He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding. He has dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. I mean, this is like deep feeling, right? He drew his bow and made me the target of his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughing stock of all my people. They mock me in song all day long. He has filled me with bitter herbs and given me gall to drink. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I hoped for, hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. And as I said, the Psalms have very similar poems. I'm just going to read one of my favorite ones that I have actually prayed in a lament. Because when you often can't find the words to, sh to get those emotions up, try praying some Psalms back to God. Try praying through the Lamentations. So this is one I've often prayed. Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praises for he has been good to me. And so today, what I want to just look at is what do the authors of Lamentations and what does David and the other authors of the Psalms teach us about what to do when we're feeling forgotten or ignored? When you're wrestling with your thoughts day and night, when you're ruminating in anxiety, when you have sorrow in your heart. And so I want to look at four things. One is that our emotions are a gift from God who shares our full range of emotions. That God invites us to bring our whole self to him. That God's primary answer to your lament is himself. And then when in pain and confusion, remain faithful by surrendering to God's love. So through the Old Testament, we're introduced to a God who is delighting in, longing for, rejoicing with, grieving over his people. We even see a God that gets angry sometimes but is slow to do so. And, of course, we get an even fuller and clearer picture of this God in Jesus who weeps at the death of a good friend, who laments in anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane over his own impending death, who demonstrates anger toward injustice and misuse of power, who receives children and outcasts with joy, and clearly loves to celebrate and have a good time because he's always at a party. So emotions or feelings are a bodily response to our experience and thoughts and the meaning we make on them. So these happen quickly and automatically. Most of us don't recognize it. We have an experience, we have a thought, we put meaning on it, and then we have an emotion that attaches itself to that. And so 
we, emotions are just what they are. Like they just are the feelings that come over us attached to the meaning we're making. We can't judge our emotions. What we're responsible for is what we do with them, what our reaction or response to our emotions are. So emotional maturity comes from having the courage to explore what are my emotions telling me? What are they telling me about the meaning I'm making? What are they telling me about my past? What are they telling me about my current circumstances, about the thoughts I have about God or people around me? What are they pointing to? And then expressing them in ways that lead to connection with God and others, rather than either stuffing them or anesthetizing them or allowing them to be expressed in ways that hurt and damage you and other people. And so that's why the gift of lament is a gift and why it's so healing, because it's both an invitation to bring all of our pain, our longing to God, and then an invitation to surrender to the love of God. When we don't know what to do, we just surrender to the love of God. And I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that. God invites us to bring our whole self to him. So he's provided a means to connect with him in our pain and our confusion and anger. And so there's tons of healthy ways to express your pain. I think therapy is great. I think meeting with spiritual directors. I think meeting with good spiritual friends. All of those things are great ways to process our pain and anger, giving and receiving prayer from people. But I do think God invites us to start with him, to first start by trusting him with the full weight of our joy, our longing, and our pain. So are we allowed to be angry at God if that's, if that's a strong feeling we're having? I think it's futile to morally judge our emotions, as I said earlier. If we're mad at God, we can't move forward without just acknowledging that. It just is a reality, right? We have to acknowledge that. And the interesting thing about anger is anger is typically protecting us from a, a deeper, more painful feeling like pain, like grief and fear. It's usually like sort of a protective early feeling for deeper, harder to reach emotions. So when we're in a lot of pain over a loss or something we can't change, we might be angry at a God who loves us and is not fixing the thing, who's not changing the thing. He's not changing the circumstance that's hurting us. And so often we experience anger as a way to avoid facing deep grief or loss or disappointment, or we're afraid. Like we feel out of control and anxious, and this will manifest in anger because we think if we can start just managing all the people around us and the circumstances, we'll feel more secure. And so it becomes like an anger control situation. So it will not benefit us and our relationships to remain in our anger at some point, we'll need to meet God in the deeper places of the pain that the anger is pointing to. But it doesn't do any good to feel guilty about admitting that we're angry, which just is the actual feeling we're having. So we have to start with acknowledging what is. And here's the deal. God already knows. It's not like by saying it out loud, he's like, what? You're mad at me? I mean, he knows. He knows exactly how you feel, what you think. And you are sitting in a pool of God's grace when you're coming to him, when you sit in front of God and finally feel the freedom to say the truth, he's like, there we go. All right, hello, nice to meet you. I'm glad we're telling the truth now. This is where I do my best work. When you're bringing your whole self to me and you're saying what really is. So God's inviting you, longing for you to come and be honest with what's really inside of you. Because we can't move forward until we start with the truth, right? So we start with the truth, whatever it is. Thank you, God, saying thank you for inviting me to the deepest places of you. And, I, and if you're thinking something like, well, how can I have a right to be angry? God doesn't owe me anything. He's already given me his whole life. What if these emotions are revealing my pride or self-pity or a sense of entitlement? That's okay. Because like I said, the beginning of healing and freedom is just being honest with right where we are. We can't get to the next layer of what is this emotion pointing to, even if it's something that needs to be addressed, if we don't start with what's really going on. So God can't shine a light on your pride, for example, if shame is keeping you from being honest about it. So a prayer of lament is an invitation to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. God's primary answer to your lament will be himself. So humans from the beginning of time have tried to make sense of their suffering. We want answers, we want someone to blame, we want to make sense of it because it can feel unbearable. 
And sometimes when we're on the other side of something, we can glimpse back and get a, a picture of God's redemptive purposes in our suffering in, in a particular situation. But usually when we're in it, we can't see that. The primary way God answers us when we cry out to him in pain is with himself. He covers us, he fills us, he meets us in our deepest places of longing and pain. When we come to the end of ourselves, we land on the love of God. My personal intimacy with God has been formed primarily out of laments. I spent many days and nights wailing and howling in the presence of God. And there are ways he has met me there over the years. Sometimes I just feel like held and met by the Spirit of God. Sometimes I feel like a huge weight of peace restored where there wasn't any. Sometimes I'm given a gift of hope. Sometimes I'm given powerful revelations, like he speaks to me very personally and intimately. Sometimes I'm delivered from something that's keeping me in bondage, but it's always with him. It's just always with his love and with himself. He's always the ultimate answer to our confusion, pain of longing, just like that song we sang. That's why that song's so powerful. It's just Jesus, just Jesus. Sometimes it's all we know is Jesus is above all of this. And sometimes that's all we can cling to. And that's what he gives you when, you when you don't have an answer that you couldn't even make sense of anyway. And finally, when in pain and confusion, remain faithful by surrendering to God's love. Lamentations 3.22 to 24 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Psalm 13, 5 and 6, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. There is this profound mutual trust that is built in seasons of confusion and pain when we just remain faithful by surrendering to God's love for us and surrendering to his faithfulness to us. So we're angry, but we worship anyway. We're in pain, but we remain in relationship. We're scared, but we remember that he has been good to me. We feel forgotten, but we wait for him. He's shown up before, he's going to show up again. I want to close with kind of a personal story um, that God brought to mind when I was working through this because I felt like it was a word for some of you. I, um, I spent many years working through my own anger at God. I was angry for a while. And there were seasons where it was hard for me to even pray. I remember actually trying to ignore God for like a week. I was so mad at him once. I was like, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm just going to like go to the movies and distract myself. I was like having a total passive-aggressive moment with God. It didn't last very long, but I tried. Um, I had trouble worshiping. I felt like uh, just like a thing would come over me during worship and I, like a stubbornness in my heart. And over time, through lots of healing and lots of laments and lots of prayer, like it, the anger lifted and lifted and my, it, you know, it was really just a way of protecting from this, just bro my broken heart. And the more my heart was mended by the love of God, the less and less angry I felt, where it would only rise up every once in a while to the point where I forgot I was even still holding on to some anger. And then I remember one day I was working with my spiritual director and I was telling her, I said, I feel some shame, but I really don't know what it's about. I'm just feeling it. And she's like, well, why don't we usually, often if we feel shame, sometimes there's something hidden that just needs to be brought to the light. So let's just ask God, is there something hidden? So we got quiet, and I just heard so clearly in my spirit, I just heard God say, you're mad at me. Not in any kind of judgmental way, just a matter of fact, you're mad at me. And as soon as he said it, I, I realized he was right. He, I still was mad at him, and, I, and it was just grieved me. I, was, I felt some grief, got emotional, and then I told her what I thought God said to me. And she goes, well, let's ask God what he wants to say about that. So we just got quiet again, and I just heard God say, you've been mad at me, but you've continued to follow me. You just said, well done, good and faithful servant. And when I was working on this, I just felt, I really felt like that was God's word for some of you. I just really, um, I really think this is God's word for some of you right now. And so I just want to sit with it for a minute. I think God's saying to some of you very personally, you've been mad at me or you are mad at me, but you've remained faithful. 
Well done, good and faithful servant. I just need you to let that land on you for a minute. Sometimes we forget that we bless the heart of Jesus. <laughs> that it blesses him, that you still love him, even when you're mad and confused, that you still show up in worship. That actually touches and changes the heart of the God of the universe. And I want you to understand that, that you personally affect the God of the universe, your love for him, your devotion, your faithfulness to him. He's telling you today, well done, good and faithful servant. I feel like um, as we move into the worship team, you can stay where you are. Time of worship and prayer. Um, I felt like the Lord wanted to um, remind you to, the prayers in the Lamentations were like a corporate prayer individual people were suffering but they were suffering as a people and if you're part of this family you don't need to suffer alone like we suffer together we bear each other's burdens and I think when we gather like this it's a good reminder a good opportunity just for you to know you're not alone and so I felt like I wanted us before we move into worship just to gather around people that may be going through a particularly um, painful season right now and just to lay hands on them or just stand near them and just kind of bless them. That God would just meet, meet them with himself. So if you feel brave enough just to slip your hand up, if you're one of those people that's just in a season of suffering. So we've got one here, two here. Anybody else? I, I just, I want you to know you're not alone. Anybody else in a particular season where you would just be blessed to have some of your brothers and sisters come alongside of you? All right, we're going to take some time to pray. And if some of you who are near Joanne and Israel want to just gather around them and bless them as we move into a time of prayer. We'll also have a prayer team in the back. If you weren't ready to respond to that call right now, but as we're sitting here, you think, you know, I could really use some prayer. And you guys can go ahead and start praying. <laughs> um, there'll be some people in the back that would be happy to come alongside and pray for you. If you were like, ah, I just felt weird having a, putting my hand up, but I, I do think this is a season where I could benefit from just knowing I'm not alone in my suffering and that I have a family that is, that is holding me and praying for me and with me. Um, so anytime during worship, you can come back and receive prayer. And um, I know Joanne's on the worship team, so we'll just take some time. When you're ready to come up, we'll start worship. And I'm just going to pray for all of us. And I'll be in the back along with Riley if you want to come back and receive prayer. And whenever the worship team's ready, you can go up and start worship, okay? Lord, I, um, I just really sense your deep love for every person in this room today. And I, I sense that you want them to know that they are loved by you, and that you, um, that your heart is moved by their devotion to you. And so I just pray right now, God, where people are um, needing you to meet them in a deeper place of longing and disappointment and pain, I pray right now that you would come, that you would bring a deeper wave of healing, internal healing, that you would open up freedom for us to bring our whole selves to you, God, without shame, without fear, that we can enter the throne room fully and tell you the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and let you meet us there with your love and your grace and your faithfulness to us, Lord. We trust you to be honest. We trust your grace. We trust the blood you sacrificed so that we could come fully into the throne room without fear. We trust the power of your blood to heal us, to restore us, and the redemptive power of your resurrection to make sense of our suffering. Whether we see it on this tide of eternity or not, we trust that you are making sense of it. And so, Lord, we surrender today to your love, and we say, come, Holy Spirit, and just have your way with the rest of our time together. In Jesus' name.
Amen. If you want to come back and receive prayer, if you want to remain in your seats um, and continue to pray um, whenever the worship band is ready, but there's no rush. And um, those of you who are not in the worship band can um, continue to bless Israel. Um, and we'll just move into a time of prayer and worship.
close our time together, but please continue to get prayer if you need prayer, or if you didn't get prayer and you're just like, you know what, I just, I do feel like I'm, I'm kind of suffering alone, and we just want you to know that you're not, and so uh, grab someone and just say, hey, can, can you just pray for me? Just ask that God's love would meet me um, in this place. Uh, Lord, I thank you that your love is a firm foundation and that when we come to the end of ourselves, we often find you there. And so, God, I pray today that we would both learn to receive your love in our deepest places of need and we would learn to minister to other people when, when they're also in a time of suffering as this is just the human condition and we're always going to find ourselves either in that place or having an opportunity to bless someone in that place. And so I pray you teach us how to bear bear with each other, bear each other's burdens, and just walk and, and love each other's family. And so, Lord, I pray right now you'd fill us with a fresh feeling of your hope, a fresh feeling of your love and your peace in any place we need that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Say hi to someone before you go. Um, go in peace, and I look forward to seeing you as we're heading toward Easter Sunday. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Don't forget to bring stuff for the Easter baskets. All right, bless you.